Liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, August 31st, the last day of August. Time for another show. Not that I realized that it was time for another show today. I mean, I guess I knew it was time, but some, I don't know, all discombobulated today and uh, didn't get uh, all my music running that uh, makes sure that everything is running smoothly on the stream ahead of time. Just worried about uh, the boy making it to school this morning even though the bus is running a little bit late. So I guess uh, that's the saving grace here. But just uh, keeping an eye on this. And, uh, you know, it's early in the season, but already worried about, hey, did this homework get done or what? I don't know. This takes my eye off the ball and uh, tends to ruin the morning. But uh, eventually the instincts kick in and uh, you say, oh, yeah, now right about this time. I should be doing some things that have something to do with, uh, I don't know, it's habit. I should be doing something all the... Anyway, it's okay. We're here. The only person who would have panicked from all of this would have been Justice, and he was fine, and I guess basically, I don't know, what would you say, based on like 10, 12, 50, whatever years it's been here, uh, he shows up every day at 9 o'clock, more or less, regardless of what happens with playing music ahead of time. So I'm not too worried. And uh, lo and behold, here I am. But uh, uh, what can I tell you? I'm a creature of habit. And uh, I always believed that you would get in trouble for not doing these things that you were supposed to do. And apparently that's not a widespread thing anymore. Uh, you know, kids these days, I have had this problem with my own kids uh, these days. Uh, homework, A, it isn't what it used to be. And B, you know, there's some sort of new teaching methodology that I guess we've landed on over the years where homework is like kind of required, but not really required. And I guess once you let the kids know that, it's like, well, I'm not doing it. But, you know, you're supposed to do it in order to learn the things and to do well in these classes. Well, what can I tell you? I'm not required to do it, so I'm not going to do it. Well, okay, so perceptions have changed, but... Still, in all, I find myself back at, uh, well, back at the computer and getting ready to run the show and reading the day's news and realizing, gosh, a lot of things that I thought when I was a kid growing up turn out not to be true. Like, I thought that if you got together with a bunch of your friends and said, uh, the government is BS and we're going to storm the Capitol and push our way into the House chamber and take over the place until they do what we want them to do in Congress... I thought on your way into the building you would be stopped, for one thing, uh, and shot for another, and that turns out not to be true. Uh, As it turns out, I also thought growing up, this also is not true, that if the FBI came to your house and said, we think there are classified documents in here, and we're coming to, and that you stole them, and then we're here to recover them, and if they got into your storage room and there were boxes and boxes of things that looked like they contained, you know, they were government records boxes and they had reason to believe you might be hiding classified documents in and you said to them, no, you're not allowed to look in there and I will prevent you from looking in there. I thought that they would arrest you and say, well, now you're in handcuffs and we're going to look in the boxes. And then when we find classified documents in there, you're really going to be in trouble. But for now, we're arresting you just for obstructing our search, you know, obstruction of justice and all that, Uh, because they're from the Justice Department. And if you obstruct them, you know, I think you should be in trouble. But as it turns out, you kind of get to continue to play golf or do whatever you want. Maybe you have to be president or former president in order to make that work. But I still thought that they would get around eventually to arresting you. And maybe they will now that they've gotten to uh, that situation arising under a search warrant as well. But Yeah, the government filed its answers to the ridiculous motion made by Trump's people. Maybe they're attorneys, maybe they're not. I have no indication that they are. They've signed documents stating that they are attorneys and giving numbers that appear to be, you know, I guess they're bar admission numbers that might just be garbage or gobbledygook. One, seven, five, nine, eight... And you just keep giving numbers until the clerk says, I think that should be it, actually. It's like a six-digit number. Uh, 
Okay, well then that's my that's my bar number and uh, whatever. And the the responses from the government, I mean, it's slam dunk stuff. So I don't know. We'll see. I guess how this whole thing plays out. Uh, in the end, somebody may be led away in handcuffs besides Trump. And in fact, it might be them before Trump. Obviously, they're pretty hesitant to to do the cuff Trump thing and walk him away. But the lawyers or people who said they were lawyers who he stood up in their path, uh, it should not be such a big deal. And it seems from all the reviews of the documents and the review of the uh, the answer from the government to this motion to appoint a special master, like there's going to be some people, you know, clapped in irons for this. It's not smart lawyering. And I can't tell you why it's taking so long to do this stuff, but this is just one of those... I guess the wheels turn slowly, and, and and I know that's the excuse every time, but it, it's a justified excuse. This the these responses to the motion lay out exactly how slow it is, that, and we already all all knew the story. I think by now from the reporting that the records people thought that there were documents missing. They asked politely, sort of that kind of thing. Can we have the documents back? And that's what yielded the fifteen boxes. And then they were like, we still know there's stuff missing. So we asked you and you gave us this, but that's not it. So I guess we'll use uh, the grand jury subpoena to compel you to give us the rest. And then they still didn't give them the rest. They gave them some more. And clearly that still wasn't it. And then, you know, in the meantime, they signed documents swearing that it was it. And we looked all over the place. And then they did the search warrant. And the search warrant results are, well, now we have evidence that you were lying the first two times. And we have evidence that you're lying even more afterwards as well. It kind of has to come down to trouble for somebody. So we'll wait and see. And it's almost September. And that means the January 6th committee may may be uh, getting ready to reconvene pretty soon. I don't think... This is on their docket, but what the hell? I mean, it's certainly going to color uh, the proceedings when they do go back into session. Greg Dworkin is here. He should be in session. I should stop. Time for let me uh, let him interrupt me for a little while. Good morning, Greg. You ready to interrupt? I am. In fact, uh, we'll Are you start sure? with Jamie Dupre, regular order. Okay. Well, that, that's what he calls his uh, newsletter. That's a good name. My regular and, uh, order. You know, here, here's the summary. I'm going to give you some Twitter summaries of what's going on here. Not but. Really. My summary is pretty simple. I'm not a lawyer, of course, so you have to understand All right. that. When That's I talk, okay. You can still represent Donald Trump. Apparently, uh, Trump's legal strategy is being led by Al Capone because he he decided to listen to them when they said, look, they can't get you an insurrection, so give them obstruction, sir. I guess so. Sure, go ahead and try that. Uh, yeah, yeah, why not? I mean, what do you got to lose? Uh, Tom Hagen is un- unavailable to represent you, so we'll just have to go with these other people who are pretty good at uh, uh, representing parking garages. Maybe. Uh, you know, I don't know. No parking garages are well known garage. for obstruction. You're often putting your car behind the pillar, and we are used to this, sir. So, right. you know, we'll be more than happy we to do this cover. for you. Right. Yeah. I, 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 what do they, I don't know how much trouble they get in. I'm assuming people have car accidents in them, but that light so, was uh, green. Jamie and Dupre it writes, been uh, Trump documents. The Justice Department told the federal judge hmm. late Tuesday night that the Fed sought a search warrant for former President Donald Trump's Florida home only yes. after it became apparent that Trump's team had likely concealed and removed highly classified documents being sought by the National Archives and that efforts were likely taken to obstruct the government's investigation. In other words, Trump was in possession, they presented evidence of, uh, stolen documents that did not belong to him, which was going to be a key part of this. Yes. Storage room. While Trump's lawyers had assured FBI officials during a June meeting that no classified materials were located outside a storage room at Mar-a-Lago, the court filing said that wasn't true, as more documents were discovered in Trump's office desk yes, during I mean, the search, which makes it hard, by the they, way, for Trump to say, well, I didn't know. I, well, were. he probably rarely looks in his desk. That's That may be. But uh, by the way, I mean, I know it shouldn't matter, but when they said, uh, we'll allow you to, you know, look at, or, or we looked and there's nothing outside the storage room, you know, but there was also stuff was inside the storage room at the time, too. I mean, they still had classified documents. Well, the then thing they is, part that they of the filing the from room. the DOJ said that when they went, uh, I guess this was in January, to pick up whatever was there, they mm. were not allowed 
into the storage yeah. room to check for themselves. Like, what do you mean not allowed FBI? I, that's the part that puzzles me. Like, I think the FBI goes where they want, more or less. Well, you know, you need a search warrant. Yes, I, I guess so. so and they that's got one. They went and got it. And now they're like, well, I can't believe you're going to search warrant. Why didn't you just ask? I did. And you said no. So I went and got a search warrant because that's the ultimate yes. Back to Jamie Dupre. Materials, hmm. the classification levels range from confidential to top secret. The feds included a photo taken at the time of the yes, raid. Right. And that photo uh, has clearly marked secret SCI document, uh, secret compartmentalized uh, document in right. the foreground. It also says HCS, which means it contains human source intelligence, one of the most sensitive products of the U.S. intelligence community, the kind of thing that gets people killed. That photo, that single photo, is uh, making the rounds. You'll see it everywhere yes, with the documents displayed, redacted by the FBI for the parts that you could read if you blew it up. Right. And, uh, you know, there's two important things about that besides uh, confirming that, yeah, these are really important documents. Uh, first of all, the the taste in rugs is terrible, which uh, <laughs> well, uh, that's Twitter true, has noted. Sure. And secondly, there's also uh, on the side a box containing a Time magazine framed photo of Trump. Several, I think. Which uh, uh, the uh, GOP uh, uh, Twitter account right. basically says that's all they got, a picture of Trump, you know, it, like the stupidest comment in the it. world <laughs> as if the interns had taken over the court filings right and we're going to represent trump in federal court saying uh this is all about that time photo mm -hmm. there's a dead body next to it but but everybody yeah, look forget about that L yeah. look at this rug. what it's, it's a crime terrible. to draw up chalk outlines on the may yeah right it's uh it's, it's unbelievable that they had that to say but of course this was the house republicans uh from the judiciary committee tweeting this with an eye roll emoji but but uh no one, as I'm saying, no one looks the other way on crime quite like Jim Jordan. Nobody right. does it better. As far as congressional response, Democrats are outraged and the new details about the evidence. Uh, it's long past time to arrest and prosecute Trump, said yes. Representative Brandon Boyle, Democrat, Pennsylvania. Let's go. Brandon. So uh, Twitter is on it. Let me give you some uh, pundit on Twitter uh, responses to this. Andrew Weissman, the Trump mm -hmm. filings for a special master were a huge misstep. Yes. The Department of Justice yes. has used its response to disclose damning proof of a series of crimes which it would not otherwise have been able to do, and one very compelling photo, uh, and he could have added of a remarkably ugly rug. Yes, uh, it really is. Horrible. Big picture, says Andrew Weissman, you don't make a filing this strong, bold, and factually accusatory if you don't have every intention to indict. And one third thing from Andrew Weissman, hmm. important note, footnote one. He says FN1. I presume that means footnote in legalese. Mm -hmm. Footnote one in DOJ brief says it's fine result. with the court unsealing the new detailed inventory of search evidence and giving it to Trump. So expect even more proof of what was found. What a colossal misstep this Trump motion was. Colossal. Yeah, right. Well, it, did. it gave him an opportunity to lay out uh, pretty plainly uh, giant crimes that were happening. Right. Hugo Lowell from The Guardian says the DOJ says in response to Trump's. Remember, I said this is going to be important. A little foreshadowing here of the story. I don't have any DOJ says music. in response to Trump's special master request that the former president lacks standing to seek judicial relief, relief or oversight <laughs> as to presidential records because He's... these records don't belong to him. Man, he's not the president either. Right. Orrin Kerr is a little more. Uh, crystal clear about this mm -hmm. the u.s government owns the property trump stole the court mm -hmm. can't order the owner of stolen property to try it return it to the thief mm -hmm. yeah right that's not usually the way it goes is Warren it? Kerr's pretty conservative so you know it's pretty remarkable to see him lay out like that and i thought yeah. that was pretty good joe walsh does an even better job he stole stuff that wasn't his, super classified stuff. They repeatedly asked him to return the stuff. He refused. They tried to help him. He lied about the stuff, hid the stuff, obstructed the search for the stuff, and then they came and got the stuff. Yeah. He should I mean, be indicted. It's kind of straightforward, really, the way most people understand these things. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand most of this. Right. George Conway, who is a lawyer, said, well, mm. here's what happened. They asked for the DOJ to punch him in the face, and that's what the DOJ did. Mm. Yeah. I so, mean, uh, that was the request, sir. Yep. Whack. Okay, well. Bradley Moss has a much longer, uh, you know, too long didn't read sort of thing. Oh. 
But basically, plainly marked classified records to Mar-a-Lago delayed, obstructed, and resisted government efforts to recover them. Here his staff concealed the records from investigators. They got caught doing so. End. Yeah. Uh, and his wasn't even all that long. I put his aside. His was a pretty thorough explainer. Uh, Laura Rosen has an even longer version of but the same thing. But they all add up to the same thing. It was a, an escalating uh, series of requests, demands, and then finally search warrants. And they failed at every step and they obstructed at every step and kept swearing that they didn't have more and they kept finding more. You're a liar right here on camera. Everybody can see you with what you've got. Here's the picture of what you said wasn't there. I don't know what to tell you, except, you know, there, there are still Republicans who are like, well, big deal, a Time magazine cover, ignoring the bodies. OK, right. but, you know, clearly isn't going to work. It's not going to work in federal court. I mean, it's not going to work in the court of public today, opinion. Most so. people think he already ought to be, you know, indicted for this. All right. So, Let's begin. you know, th- this. So what does Trump do? He gets on his own Truth Social, which is a sure. tiny, tiny, tiny platform compared to the Twitter one that he's banned from. Like his hands. And says, I'm the rightful queen. <laughs> Essentially, why not? I am the queen and nobody should bother me. And uh, uh, off with their heads. And we need this storm. And look at all these Q accounts which agree with me. Hmm. And everybody gather and, uh, you know, let's oh, do one yes, of those gather. 1776 Patriot things. Oh, please gather. And, you know, and, you know, he's nuts. Yes, uh, I need to go. One of the sound effects I need to get is uh, if they keep threatening to gather, I'm going to start playing that uh, Bayraktar song that you found for us on the Internet. I love that Bayraktar That's song. A, it's fun and it's uh, rousing and everyone loves it for the morning and it doesn't mean anything in particular. I'm just saying if you gather it's got in a large good groups, it, that's all. You know, you'll want to hear this song. It might be the last song you hear, but it, you'll want to hear it. So writer and pundit Adam Davidson Mm -hmm. writes, you know, my frustration with much of the Trump coverage from the White House correspondence over the last few years boils down to this. I'll say this with the background that Chuck Todd is in trouble, probably be axed from Meet the Press. Yes, but we'll get to that in a minute. We do have to get to that. My frustration with much of the Trump coverage from the White House correspondence over the last few years boils down to this. This man today, Mm -hmm. with all his crazy QAnon tweets, self-destruction, lazy grip, mental instability, is... Who he's always been, clearly and openly. Yes. And this has been obvious for years, for decades. Oh, yeah. But when you read, see, or hear coverage of Trump from many of the top White House reporters, you don't get that basic fact. Either they know this and didn't share it with their audience, or they didn't and therefore mm-hmm. are unqualified to report. Or they're writing a book. It's wrong to just blame the reporters, though I do blame them. This is an indictment of journalistic norms, deference to authority, commitment to both sidesism, etc. He's the single most consistent, predictable, and wildly ill person in public life. Although I did say to Adam, you know, you should also consider the coverage of Herschel Walker. Hmm. We do go yeah, through these brief <laughs> moments where everybody reports on him as he actually is. And then within days or hours, we go back to pretending he's a normal person and his supporters of principle. I yeah I can't understand it but uh, my again my take on it for years has been I don't understand why they they seem to know what to do with Vermin Supreme every four years even though he's running for president he's literally he is running for president they just don't treat it that way and it's because he has a boot on his head but Donald Trump paints his face uh, as I've always said basketball orange and tells everybody he's tan and they go mm, all right, well, he has got a suit and that's one thing he has over Vermin Supreme well I also pointed out to Adam that years ago the coverage of W's Iraq war wasn't much better and that's mm, how blogs yes, were born that's true what are we getting now truth social nothing yeah. So that that's the context uh, by which I think you have to look at what's going on with uh, Meet the Press. I mean, ah, there yes, is okay. Over there. a lot of uh, <sighs> yeah of uh, uh, Wrong concern word. about the fact that nobody watches Meet the Press anymore, and they're blaming Chuck Todd, uh, uh, which is probably unfair in the sense maybe. that, uh, and as I wrote this morning on Twitter, the problem with Meet the Press is the format's dead. I mean, yes. you have two Republicans and a neutral reporter discussing why the Democrats are in disarray every Sunday. Yeah, that and and the Republic. It's a platform for Republicans to go on TV to lie because they never get challenged on their lies, and nobody watches. Yeah, so so of course it's not going to do well. And if you I mean, uh, replace it wouldn't even Chuck Todd with the Kristen Welker, you know who deserves a promotion, fine. Uh, it's not going to save the uh, format. It's not, not adversarial. It's that same enough. format. 
Right. And it's the well, same format. Weird. Yes. You know, but yeah, I mean, even in, in in like the olden days, the I guess you would say the glory days, the glory of days the of Tim Russert, you know, who at least would challenge people with facts. Yeah, but he would say, "Well, we got to have people on here who, re- if you're going to talk about what the Democrats are doing, you got to have a Democrat." But I mean, not only that, you know, if you had a Republican who lied to, to you, right? Russert would pull yeah, up yeah. with, "Well, you just said this, and that was the opposite of what you just told us. So how do you explain that, sir?" Yeah, and he would do that over and over and over until you were embarrassed enough so that you wouldn't come on the show and yeah. do that. Yeah, let's just say that's lacking. It, it is, and there are moments every once in a great while someone will circulate a clip of Chuck Todd kind of doing that, and then of course we're out of once. time. Right? Uh, there's a question, right. and there's a yeah, yeah. half-hearted follow-up question sometimes, and there's never a third question. You have to or move a, on but that's because not inflation true, sir. or something. You right? Yeah. Do that. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't come up. Or, you know, it, you can see that that's in Chuck Todd's mind, but yeah, it just doesn't, you don't get the blast of, well, everybody, I'm here to tell you that's not true. And this guy just, I, I gave him a national forum to talk to you and he lied and you do what you need to do with that information. That's what I thought was supposed to be the end result of those shows, but it hasn't been for, how long was he on the show? Right. 15 well, years? you know, ever since David Gregory, but you know. Uh, right. Probably less than 15, but uh, okay. You know, was it the uh, White House Correspondence Center where uh, the host, uh, uh, you know, said something to Chuck Todd about, you know, how, you know, wow. glad you're here. Hope you're having a good time. How are you doing? Oh, wait a minute. That's a follow up question. That's probably not something you understand. <laughs> Maybe. To paraphrase, uh, you know, it, right. he's famous for it. Or famous for not. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he's got a great personal interest in the stories and in politics. I'm not certain why for his own sake he's not interested. Access, in you know. Yeah, it's all I about guess. access because if I'm really tough on these people, they won't come back. And somehow or other. Uh, and then what will you happen? Know, You'll lose the people show? People think that that's the reason why you watch the show. You watch yeah. the show because Lindsey Graham is on. It's got nothing to do with what he says or what he's asked. But that's simply untrue. And that's why the foreman has to go. Yeah, I mean, the whole I show guess. can go and nobody would care. Uh, yeah, at this point, and I mean, you know, maybe it was just inevitable for, uh, in the changeover from the days when there were three networks to now there's a billion and everybody can have one in their basement. But you know, there were things to do with it that you could have done to maintain interest, and they haven't happened. Yeah, so I mean, okay. they could do it uh, monthly when they report the results of the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll. You know, because yeah. that's really the only okay. news that's done, and then. Their own network covers it, uh, you know, mm. on their cable, and that's about it. So, you know, well, no one will miss it, I don't think. And uh, and, and, and he's not in bad shape. I'm sure he made a ton of money, and uh, he doesn't have to work again. And fine, everybody's happy. Just don't worry about it. Don't be. Don't feel bad about canceling this show. Uh, although I guess maybe they'll want to give it to somebody else and let them screw around with it for a while. Fine. Right. Now, there's other stuff going on besides that. Obviously, uh, Joe Biden no, was in Pennsylvania. He'll be in Pennsylvania for a few days. He's going to give an important speech tomorrow night, prime mm. time. Okay. He was willing and able uh, to identify the fact that uh, Democrats are the law and order party because he okay. doesn't support sure, defund yeah, the police yeah. and he doesn't support <laughs> defunding the FBI. And Republicans do. And how mm. can you call yourself the party of law and order if you won't? Uh, you know, denounce what happened on January 6th. And he's right. absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And he's going to go into that in a big way on Thursday night. And he should remember, uh, you know, he called the Republican semi fascist and was taken to task for using semi. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. By Mike right. Godwin of Godwin's law. And, and so, you know, that, that's about right. And I think that that's important. Other background is uh, uh, libs of TikTok and other uh, uh, right wing uh, accounts are trying to gin up uh, anger and uh, upsetness with uh, children's hospitals because uh, they cover trans kids. Right. Trans kids, by the way, are also known as kids. Right. And yes. so they give them Very uh, medical care, which is what children's hospitals are supposed to do. Uh, yesterday, Boston police set up a perimeter around Boston Children's Hospital after a bomb threat was called. Bomb squad called in. They report nobody hurt. They're sweeping the building. As Ben Collins, who covers the right-wing cesspools uh, for NBC News, notes, uh, at what point in placing the bomb threat to the children's hospital do you not realize that you're the bad guy? Yeah, I don't know why that uh, never occurs to them. But but we're used to that from the gun stories, uh, you know, when they threaten to shoot you to teach you why you need a gun. 
I'll shoot you, and then you'll wish you had a gun to shoot me, but why don't you just shoot yourself? And then we could all wish we had guns. How about that? But that never occurs to them either. And if you remember the water issues back up in Michigan from a few years back. Oh, yes, sure. uh, There's water issues in uh, Jackson. There are, and there have been for a long time. Uh, But yes, now they're in Mississippi. Um, and you know, real problems. Th- this has been an issue for years and years and years and years. And you know, getting uh, a couple of hundred million dollars from the infrastructure bills is great, but it's going to take a half a, you know, one and a half billion dollars to fix it. Aging systems, racism, multi-governmental, ignoring the problem, jacking up prices without mm-hmm. fixing the issue. It's gotten to the point where the water system uh, authority there can't even figure out how to get revenue. So it's just a mess and nobody knows when it's going to be fixed. And, uh, of course, the governor of Mississippi, Tate Reeves, isn't mm-hmm. even on speaking terms with the mayor uh, of well, the city. No, so, you know, colors. it's it's, uh, it's bizarre. Yeah, uh, it is. And it's been a long time coming. Uh, but in addition to which they've now had rains that have flooded the the place and overwhelmed the, the water treatment. So I think Jackson, Mississippi is like without drinking water for the last couple of days. Uh, it's a huge disaster. And uh, it's been, a, like you said, a long time coming. You mentioned that there was racism in, involved in all this. And uh, it's an enormous uh, saga and we uh, will have to spend some time at some point unraveling all of it. Many good writers have done it for us, so we can borrow from them. That's the yeah, good news. and I've got some of those links in the Excellent. Thunder Roundup. We'll, okay. we'll talk more after the break. Yeah, well, we'll take our break, and uh, you should fish through that Pundit Roundup and pull out those links. There are some stories going way back, and I think we even did some stories way back on the show about uh, bond issues for building the water treatment plants years ago, and uh, gosh, there's a lot to it. So, All right, we'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options, too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. It's time for us to dive into the waters, I guess, down in Jackson, Mississippi. What's, uh, uh, there's what a very nice uh, Mississippi Free Press reporter uh, last year on this, talking about uh, the declining population of Jackson, Mississippi. They write for Jackson, it was the precursor to a great exsanguination, draining of many oh. of the city's wealthiest residents to the surrounding suburbs, hmm. just like what happened in Detroit. Tax payments and all. In the 80 census, Jackson's population was 200,000, the peak of the city's population. And... Uh, oh. To date, it's never grown again, each decade taking another 10,000 or so. Estimates in 2019 placed the city population about 160,000, 20% loss. The metropolitan area would grow. Uh, If you look at the original city boundaries as they were through the 1890s up through the 60s, you can see where the city used to have a small, dense footprint. And soon Jackson was catering to the car and to residents who wanted to live outside the tight city limits, away from integrated neighborhoods and schools. Jackson stretched itself then to cater to them. And, uh, you know, a lot of this, uh, much of the 60 and 76 annexations were an attempt to seek neighborhoods that were built outside the city limits, but served the city water and sewer. So you see some pretty significant population gains right before you start seeing the drop off. The size of the footprint of these trends is entirely unique in Mississippi, just as Jackson and the metropolitan area are unique to the state. 
Few Mississippi leaders have dramatically illustrated the panic that would push thousands out of Jackson city limits in the years following integration as Governor Ross Barnett. There's no mm. case in history where the Caucasian race has survived social integration, he wrote in 62. We will not drink from the cup of genocide. <laughs> but integration happened anyway. And just giving you a little bit of the history there. So the reaction to integration, which included white Jackson families immediately pulling 5,000 of their children out of local schools in 1970, was one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Another came in 72, an unintended consequence of necessary environmental reform. The Water Pollution Control Act steamrolled through a veto from Nixon. Few took notice with the eyes of the nation affixed to Vietnam, but the consequences of the new environmental regulations persist to this day. No longer could Jackson's bedroom communities deposit their wastewater in minuscule sewage lagoons where their runoff mm. leaked into creeks and rivers. Starting in 72, the federal government required secondary treatment. Yes. So within a decade, a sprawling web of interceptors would snake across the Jackson Metro, drawing from lagoon after lagoon, the lines in their many sub-interceptors meeting at a central outflow point, the Savannah Wastewater Treatment Plant in South Jackson, and the price tag for that was staggering. Hmm. The EPA willingly volunteers 75% of the entire production cost, but those interceptors sketched a familiar boundary around the city on the road to a crisis. Okay. Then hmm. came the Reagan era. I'm no. from the government, and I'm here to help. In 87, yet, President huh? Ronald Reagan had the pulsating American id firmly in his grasp. This philosophy was not so wryly worded when it showed up in policy, but showed up in policy it did. Multiple amendments to the Clean Water Act over the decade dramatically reduced federal aid. And so uh, they had this really expensive uh, way of keeping the water clean, essentially. Too long didn't read. And uh, hmm. that's part of the reason why they found themselves where they were. Jackson finds itself now without water, tortuous weeks before becoming an interminable month. And that was in March 2021. The reason is about more than just mismanagement, more than decades of delayed repair and deferred projects, white flight, regulatory burdens, federal disinvestment. It's about all of these things. A constellation of competing priorities, incentives, and complications no easier to disentangle from one another than the web of aging pipes beneath the city itself. Governor Reeves drove this point home in early March 2021. This is not an issue that's unique to our capital city. Mm -hmm. And he likely had no idea how right he was. So, you know, part of the, infra the infrastructure drive from the federal government was recognizing aging infrastructure all over the country needed to be addressed. It did. It does. You know, uh, how much help you get from this. This article was reported in 2021, well before the infrastructure bill passed. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to need follow up on in regard to uh, what happens. But. That's going to take a long time regardless. And in the meantime, people need water now. Yes. And so it's a crisis, like you said, partly because of the flooding. Uh, and what happens, you know, we'll, we'll see. But Tate Reeves really ought to be talking to the mayor and the mayor ought to be talking to the governor in terms of working together. Yes. Well, one's white, can't. one's black. It's Mississippi. I'm not sure. Yep. And, uh, well, uh, as long as, uh, well, pe people aren't being helped, of course, inside of the city, and Tate Reeves doesn't really care much about that. Uh, the capital enclave uh, does what it does, and the rest of the city is uh, wasteland as far as they're concerned. So, uh, they're, wastewater, actually. Yeah, well, now it's covered in wastewater. But uh, no surprise that Tate Reeves can't respond to this. Uh, don't forget that, uh, the, by the way, uh, the Mississippi... To no one's surprise, I guess, given its record and and now its its uh, government, um, tops in the nation in terms of the deaths by population, deaths per million from COVID, far and away in the lead. Although uh, Arizona is creeping up on it, I will make mention of that. And of course, Arizona poised to be governed by people even crazier than that if the elections go the wrong way. This so right. I would, uh, you know, I'm not doing these stories justice, and I would uh, highly recommend reading Mississippi Free Press, Nick Juden, Ashton Pittman, some of the excellent reporters these are there stories. who have a pretty good handle on uh, what's going on. Other news? Ye okay. John Anceloni points out that Gallup has a stat of the day, 19. Okay, got it. Economic confidence rose 19 points wow. since June from minus 58 to minus 39, still underwater, but moving in the right direction with inflation coming down. Republicans drive the overall negatives. 
with minus 76 mm-hmm. compared to minus 43 <laughs> with indies. Okay. So, you know, that's all important. Uh, you know, the, the fixation that uh, reporters have with Biden's approval ratings is based in part on the assumption, which may or may not be true, that uh, Biden's approval ratings will drive what happens in the midterms. And this year, we've talked ad infinitum about how that may not be true because the opposition is really not to Biden. It's to the Supreme Court and a whole bunch of other things. But also Trump who can't stay out of the midterms and can't stay out of the news. Yeah. And it turns out every time Trump is mentioned, it's good for Democrats because Democrats get infuriated. And then, by the way, look at that rug. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, if that doesn't do it, I don't know what will. And look look what's on the rug. But, you know, look at that rug. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons that uh, these midterms may turn out differently than the pundits think. Nonetheless, the point Mm, is gas prices really are dropping and uh, they'll drop for the next month, given the contracts. And, uh, you know, the uh, the inflation rate is dropping. And so what Republicans assumed would be the issues driving the election are not going to be the issues driving the election. Locally, well, don't assume. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the more uh, endangered house seats would have to be my own, uh, Connecticut Five. No, that's where Johanna Hayes is a rookie, and rookies okay. are always a yes. little bit more vulnerable than anybody else. That's true. You spend your first year in Congress if you're a normal person and you're not uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, you know, keeping your head down and learning the job and doing the work. And so you don't necessarily have a large, um, familiar profile for when people run against you. And so in a wave election, folks like that lose. Yes. But this isn't a wave election. At least it's not going to be a red wave. Mm. And so she's got a pretty good chance of uh, uh, keeping her seat. People generally like her. They, they don't dislike her. It's That's just that, uh, you know, she's not a, a, a high profile seat. Yeah. So the DCCC has now started. And I saw my first ad this morning on uh, cable news when I was watching Morning Joe. Uh, but there's a website. Uh, mm. Connecticut can't risk extreme George Logan. That's oh. her opposition. Right. And uh, what they say is what you'll see in a lot of ads against Republicans. George Logan will say what it takes to get elected to Connecticut, but here's the truth. He's just another extreme Republican, more loyal to the party than he is to us from abortion rights to gun safety. And remember, this is mm. Sandy Hook District. Right. He's out of step with our values. And if we send him to Congress, he'll give Republicans the majority they need to pass their extreme agenda, banning abortion nationwide, even in Connecticut, protecting guns instead of kids. That's what they're making the focus of this. Other places may or may not do guns, but they'll certainly do abortion, as we talked about the other day. Even Abigail Scanberger's doing that. Although what happened with Mar-a-Lago, she may go back to uh, uh, intelligence and and, uh, feel free, you know, uh, the kind of stuff that she's famous for. Uh, I'm really interested to see what Elaine Luria does in Virginia, too. Same reason. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's it's uh, quite interesting that uh, uh, the DCC is all in in uh, making abortion the issue. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking gun safety certainly is a second issue after Uvalde. And uh, we certainly hear uh, in uh, uh, CTO5, it never stopped being an issue. And I'm curious to see whether Trump and uh, treason and stolen documents are going to be issue number three and whether they wind up adding that. Treason is on the ballot. Uh, well, certainly uh, freedom and democracy are. <laughs> okay. Question. So then why are you arguing about treason? Why not throw that in there, too? Uh, really? Usually, it's an unusual placement. I agree. But well, as long as freedom and democracy things. are on there. Oh, only you three? Uh, and, of course, it needs to be uh, repetition. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me say that again. Uh, adults learn by repetition. Yes. Right. And so you got to pick your things. And then, you know, you got to see whether it fits in a yard sign. Mm. Right. Right. Uh, uh, treason. Important. That one does. Uh, yeah, it's uh, short. Uh, you can probably make it fit. Yeah, gun violence uh, you know, probably uh, will treason, be. Treason, vote for Johanna Hayes. <laughs> right. Right. Bothered uh, by treason. SCOTUS, vote for Johanna Hayes. Yeah. Basically, right. And right. Uh, choice, right, uh, as we saw, was on the signs the other day in the special election. So 
It's a little longer than Roe, but uh, everyone well, call understands up at folks in Kansas and call up, uh, you know, uh, New York 19 and see how they did it. And, uh, you know, you do it. Yeah. They'll tell you. They'll be happy to share. That makes them consultants and it brings them money. They'll be happy to tell you. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. What is today? Today is August 31st. That yeah, means, last day. I hate to tell you, end of summer. Tomorrow is September 1st. That's right. Where your white pants is, is your last chance. Well, the thing is, uh, I think they start looking at, okay, who's in third place in Alaska tomorrow? Mm, oh, okay. And they start thinking about reallocating those uh, uh, second choice votes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And see how many of the ballots, as they like to say the term of art, are exhausted. I, all of I'm exhausted. Mine are exhausted. An exhausted ballot exactly. is one that can't be used any further. So what if uh, Nick Begich is the, the third place uh, Republican who will be dropped from the special election? He's still then, running in the fall, of course. Uh, what if his uh, second place ballots are then allocated between Sarah Palin and Mary uh, Peltola, who is currently in first place? Right. And what if Nick Begich's uh, second place are empty? Because baggage voters can't stand Palin. Then that would really be an exhausted. exhausted ballot. You can't use it anymore. Right. And if uh, uh, Palin doesn't pick up a whole lot of those baggage votes, she's going to lose because she's currently behind. Well, all right. Did baggage voters actually vote for Peltola or did they simply not put in a second choice? Either way, uh, Peltola benefits. So right. she may wind up winning the special election. We'll, we'll wind Great. up seeing uh, relatively soon now. That would be nice. I, I would think, you know, be, we'd see it before November. I mean, you you, you really kind of have to, to fill the seat in order to make it make until sense. Until November, yeah. and then you have the regular election and do it all over again with the same yes. people. But I would think we'd find out before November. So the fact that tomorrow is September 1st means we're one step closer to finding out who actually won in Alaska. Uh, at least one day closer. Yeah. Um, good. That's nice. I'd like to have figure that out. It's a small state. And uh, I know it's complex that you got to count things a hundred times, but there's not that many people in Alaska. And I thought with computers, they might have been able to do it already. Right. But, uh, oh, I no. see a new line of defense from the Trump people. What is left? Uh, I'm going to just send it to I'm you, curious. let okay. you see it for yourself, and then you can comment on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Obama did it. And the Biden raid on Trump's home is election interference. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's okay. a new Tom one. Fitton. So, yeah, that this is, um, yeah, that we're too close to the election and therefore anything the DOJ does is invalid, except that there, there actually is a line and we're not past it yet. And you're out of your mind. Well, okay. number one, we're not past it yet because we're not close enough to the election for that to take effect. All right. But that's number two. Number one is Donald Trump is not on the ballot. Right. He's but actually not a declared candidate for anything at this particular point in time. That is true. And so uh, – I am yeah. not a lawyer, but I'm just pointing out – I don't know what you're talking about. That's okay. Fitton. Tom Fitton also, as it turns out, is not a lawyer. He is – though he is the head of Judicial Watch, he's not a lawyer, which I thought was interesting to find out. But uh, you know, even if he was, I mean there's no shortage of bad lawyers and he would be one. If he were a lawyer, he would be a bad one. But uh, – well, but he likes to lift weights. So yep. there you go. That's all I got on the guy. But yeah, that's wrong on two counts. Um, and both of them are pretty obvious. Okay, so that's it. I, I, all I know is that they're just now going with, well, I don't know. Whatever it was, it wasn't a crime. And it's not a bad thing because Donald Trump did it. And that's really all they have left. And that's literally it. There's no other excuse. All of them have been proven wrong by this latest filing in case you didn't think so. In case you hadn't seen it proven, now you have. But everyone had an inkling that they were lying about every one of the excuses that they gave. Now it's proven to be the case. And so, right, all they have left is to say, well, it's just not an issue. Look at the Time magazine covers instead. Hmm. Writer Gary Legume points out, you know, what if all the top secret documents wanted to go with Trump? Has anybody considered their feelings? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is no. No, we no? have not. Okay. And uh, uh, we're not oh, going at this. to, by the way, Gary. Uh, all right. That's true. How, one thing we should take a look at. This is interesting. I didn't see this. Uh, there's a little label on this uh, tweet that I saw on the um, the web-based version, but not the tweet deck-based version. Darwin, Darwin, our friend Darwin Darko had uh, tweeted us. 
the question, uh, why didn't 45 simply make copies of all the classified stuff he wanted and then return the originals? Or maybe that also did happen with a hmm emoji and the KITM hashtag. But what I didn't notice, the difference between this, is this something you can designate for yourself on your own tweet or is this some a label that Twitter hangs on you? There's a little chili pepper icon that says hot take on it. Oh, cool. <laughs> I can't tell whether that was like jokingly cool. included by Darwin or did it? Cool did, takes are hot. <laughs> did Twitter, does Twitter now have a hot take flag? Like, I don't know whether that's supposed to mean, I, I don't know what, but that's funny. All right. You're a hot take artist now, Darwin. And I, I know you've been aspiring to that for some time. So you made it. Hot taker right. that you are. Okay. So uh, remember what Wild. we said about uh, Adam Davidson's observations about how things are covered. Uh, Empty Wheeler, Ben Marcy Wheeler writes, media are now raising questions about whether Trump could be shown to have the intent to violate the Espionage Act. The intent? Intent. Sorry. Here's how Can't it would get you. presented to a jury, she writes. It wouldn't. And uh, Armando says, I don't understand the question. Yeah. <laughs> He's already clear beyond a reasonable doubt had the intent. But you'll need to present exculpatory evidence to beat what we already know. Yeah. I, and that's why uh, George Conway was saying, well, uh, they asked DOJ to punch him in the face and DOJ did. OK, I don't even I really don't understand the question. I mean, there's no intent factor in the espionage. Well, that's act. the thing. That's why I put in I my pundit so. roundup again. I'm not a lawyer, but I simply said the DOJ presents damning evidence of stolen documents. That's it. So if you stole documents and you have stuff you're not supposed to have, who cares what your intent was? You yeah. have stolen documents that don't belong to you yeah. and you refuse to return them. There are crimes where the intent matters and this isn't one of them. It's just not. It's not yeah. in there. The obstruction part, uh, you know, I suppose you can argue, well, it's a little bit of intent there. OK, well, they lied. They yeah. told you it wasn't there when it was. Mm hmm. So right now we don't what's know why. Got to do with that. I know what they did. I don't right. care why they did it. But yeah, as I've said, and, and as Marcy has pointed out, I mean, she's so far the best information that she's brought forward on the nature of the charges under the Espionage Act, where the was the jury charge, the instructions to a jury that a judge will read when they're trying someone for a violation of this part of the Espionage Act and what questions do you have to answer? And none of them involve intent. It's ne the jury is never even asked to figure out what the person's intent was. Did right. they so have them? Here's how Marcy puts it. Here's what jurors will guilty. be asked to decide. Did the defendant without authorization have possession of access to or control over a document that was national defense information? Right. Not the answer is yes. And, and and no intent, right? right. So okay, did next. the document in question actually relate to the national defense? The answer is yes. And no intent. Did the defendant have reason to believe the information could be used to the injury of the U.S. or to the advantage of any foreign nation? No. Uh, Trump is such a psychopath, she writes, that the answer to this might normally be in question. <laughs> could be, but... could be. <laughs> but again, doesn't, you know. doesn't matter and no intent. Right. Did the defendant retain the above material and fail to deliver it to the officer or employee of the U.S. entitled to receive it? Yes. Mm, resounding yes. Now, did he keep this, this document willfully? Mm, yeah. Well, well, in addition to refusing yeah. the legal request to return the documents and a lawful subpoena, uh, former president took efforts to conceal NDI information from his representatives to prevent them from returning the documents. Multiple witnesses have testified that he responded to consultations about the importance of returning documents by insisting they were, quote, mine, end right. quote. So, so all of the above, aside from the witness yes. testimony, would be backed by multiple exchanges of paperwork. So, uh, you know, he's in trouble. Yeah. Now, granted, there will be an opportunity for him to go to court and try to convince people that, no, I didn't have these documents or no, I didn't. Uh, they didn't contain national security information or no, I didn't refuse to give them back. But I don't know where that proof is going to come from because all the proof says the opposite. But he could try to produce some. And yeah. And could we haven't even gotten into Cash Patel's trial. Right. That's true, too. And uh, all of these things. But what's not there is any indication that they'll ever ask a jury 
to wonder even for a minute about why do you think he did it and what do you think he meant to do here? Because it's not relevant. It's a strict liability crime. The question is, did he have the documents? Yes or no. And did he mean to have them? Yes or no. So what I don't understand, because I'm not a lawyer, is whether or not if you're going to think about trying to indict Trump on seditious conspiracy based on the January 6th events oh, okay. and the January Different 6th crime. committee yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Uh, does uh, Trump claiming to be the queen and QAnon should rise in his defense now? Mm. Does what he said in the last 48 hours have any relevance on the charge back on January 6th? Because he was uh, circumspect about hmm. a lot of this stuff then. Okay. And he's pretty blatant about, uh, you know, wanting to overthrow the government now. Yeah. Well, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, and, and they'll, they'll certainly be arguing in court. It's a difficult thing. Because uh, his defense would say, look, he just yeah. snapped and went crazy after January 6th. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and they would also say, well, you know, he's on trial for a very specific thing here. The well, evidence no, I'm just that- saying, if you're trying to get him on seditious conspiracy, not yeah. this specific thing. Right. But if you think you have a case for seditious conspiracy, does okay. the stuff he's saying now have any relevance to that case? Yeah, they would likely say, no, the events of January 6th were over with at that point. Right, uh, and a snapping point going is, into complete spiral yeah. of decay and uh, insanity was well after January 6th. That would likely be excluded as uh, like a more prejudicial than probative. Uh, as they know, say in legal yes. terms. Right. Uh, this 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 does tend to indicate that there's an ongoing issue and an ongoing pattern here, but that's not what we're being so, asked to So the stuff that he here. posted in the last couple of days is for the pundits to say, here's how, here's why we have to go ahead yes, and do whatever they have in terms of evidence, uh, real-time, um, yeah. contemporaneous, yada, yada. But for all of these people arguing that it would be a mistake to try to uh, prosecute him, uh, we would point to what he did in the last 40 hours and say, this is why you have to. Yeah, this is an indication that the troubles are but escalating. It's, but it's not what he's going to be indicted for because it's free speech and you're allowed to say wacko stuff. Mm, yes, uh, right, to an extent. And as he creeps closer and closer to calling for I mean, he's violence setting up his to defend next himself. Trial. Yes, right. Well, if it, anybody may, actually gets hurt from what he said, he could end up being charged, issue. right, for but, but, a seditious you know, conspiracy. This isn't again. the movies, and you can't get him on a future crime at this particular point in time. Uh, right. But, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things he can get himself in trouble for. Uh, but uh, it, it, it would take a lot to tie this back to January 6th. Well, anyway, so, you know, I bring this up because, again, I'm not a lawyer and a lot of normal people will look at this and say, well, why, you know, why is he allowed to say this stuff and why can't we? Yeah. Do-? Well, there's reasons because we're rule of law. And so First we Amendment, you're allowed to do here. a lot of wacko stuff. Mm, yes. Uh, some of it will land you in trouble and some of it will be used as evidence against you, certainly. But- Should something happen. Yes. Uh, if nothing happens, then it's just bombast. Uh, well, yeah, uh, mostly. Right. I mean, as what it generally comes down to, although the presidential bombast can do some well, more damage president. than others. That's oh, wow, well, that's true, too. But uh, bombast in a suit he, he and tie. He thinks he's queen, but he's not. Right. Uh, all right. He thinks he's the queen of England, in other words. Well, uh, yeah. And he doesn't know how to get a uh, get himself in white tie and have it fit right. So that's you get a little, you know, your job cut out for you if you want to how, remain how queen. How long would one of his white bow ties be? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the problem, and all the extra material ran out the bottom of his vest, and that's what he ended up looking like. Uh, he, he didn't handle the formalities of royalty very well. So anyway, you know, there's mm-hmm. things we don't know, and there's things we can't do. So you know, based on this discussion, and uh, you know, thank you for clarifying some of this. So the fact that he's like totally wacko on his own personal uh, 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 Twitter knockoff platform has little or nothing to do with legal cases against him. Mm-hmm. We don't know whether or not his intent of holding on to the documents is, in fact, a crime. Might be, but we don't know that. There's mm-hmm. not enough evidence to say that we knew he do something. We, we knew he did something with it. I mean, there's there's tantalizing stuff out there. There's reports that uh, he had information on Macron. There's point uh, information 
that, uh, you know, he asked about uh, certain lists of spies and then they went missing after that. We, but, you know, we don't know any of that stuff. Mm. That's not uh, hard evidence the way that picture on the rug is hard evidence of, uh, you know, possessing stolen material. So uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff out there. But again, you know, hey, maybe I'm right. Maybe this is Capone. Maybe he did a whole bunch of stuff you can't prove, but uh, you could prove this, and so you get him. Well, you start with that, sure, and uh, it's fairly serious, and uh, yeah. God, what can I tell you? There's more to come, and uh, as the uh, well, as the trouble Republicans piles would up. like the uh, uh, midterm not to be about Donald Trump. By the way, mm-hmm. good luck with that. I'm sorry. What? Good luck with making it not about oh. Donald Trump. Oh, yes. Well, right. I mean, Donald Trump is going to make it about Donald that's Trump. That's true. He won't let you out of, of that. And he'll and be angry he with you party. if you try. You don't. That's true. If you try to distance yourself or the rest of the party from Donald Trump, he will get angry with you and he will disavow you. It's too late for him to primary you this so time. You're stuck. I guess. You know, uh, you yeah. can't stick with him because he's going to bring your party down, but you can't leave him because he would bring your party down. That's right. So I, I'm over it. You know, couldn't have yeah. happened to a nicer party. That's true. If it was going to happen to one of them, and there were only two to choose from in in our system, uh, we would choose the other one. I mean, to have this happen to. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, oh, here's some news. Darwin says that you can, in fact, hang the uh, hot take label on your own tweet. So that's what he did. So as a, a, a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, it is quite a hot take, too. So now, now that I know we can do that, we should just put that on all our tweets. Yes. Well, we should put it on the show. I'm glad it wasn't involuntarily labeled. Yeah, you know, right. We the whole verbally show label this show as hot takes for Wednesday. That's the whole thing. That should. But we're the supposed name to do it at the beginning, the beginning, so I'm afraid we're going to have to do the whole thing all over again. All right. Well, uh, give it about an hour, and we'll come back and do it again. Yep. All righty. Anyway, that brings you to the end oh, of the fact, hour. You give so, it a day. Uh, music should be starting any second, according to my internal this clock. This is the second for it. Yes, good. You're right about that. All right. So, well, rather than waiting an hour, we'll, just to be certain we have enough news, we'll wait 24 or 23 at this point to start again. And uh, we'll give it another shot. And uh, we are in the, the, the rare situation where a Wednesday and Thursday coincide with the close of one month and the open of another. So we'll bridge the gap that way. Uh, and you'll be here to do it. Thanks very much. And we'll see you tomorrow. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I realized after we left that we did not make mention of the fact that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev died yesterday. And uh, everyone remembers him, of course, from the Pizza Hut commercial that he did, which is apparently an actual thing. I, I don't think I ever really – I may have known that at some point and it didn't stick in my mind. That's not what he's chiefly famous for. Uh, but uh, I also don't have much to say about that. Um, he was an interesting figure in his own right, and I wonder whether we'll ever find out, uh, uh, you know, more about him than we would appreciate knowing. I mean, he seemed like I guess he was a pretty popular figure in the West. The Pizza Hut commercial tried to make him look like he was a pretty popular figure inside of Russia. I don't know whether that's really true these days or whether that's officially okay. Uh, and I guess you can watch and see what sort of remembrances of Gorbachev are permitted inside of Putin's Russia today, and maybe you can gauge it. But at any rate, we should at least note his passing. He was an important figure in his day and uh, a significant death in that respect. Otherwise, uh, let's see, other news that I, I mean, I, I thought we should at least make a quick mention of it, uh, if nothing else. It's, uh, but. Uh, switching topics. Shall we switch topics or should we stay on this one? Let's see. We'll stay on this one for a little while and then, uh, we'll sprinkle the rest of the second hour with various other topics that I put aside. The, uh, let's see. We've got a couple of write ups on the filing from the DOJ. Um, but I think we've covered it, you know, pretty thoroughly. Like I said, there were a couple of really interesting Twitter threads, people, um, as soon as the filing was released, you know, read it and kind of live blogged their reading of it on Twitter. Um, as Greg mentioned, Brad Moss, Bradley Moss had a, uh, excellent and I think rather succinct, though still somewhat lengthy, uh, 
encapsulation of everything. And, uh, you know, I, I guess... I guess we've covered it. The best uh, encapsulation you can give it without getting too detailed is that essentially this was a long-running escalation by the DOJ from, hey, we've figured out that he has these documents. You should give them back to us by request. Uh, it didn't get everything back by request, and so they moved to the subpoena. Didn't get everything back by subpoena, and so moved to search warrant. And even now, probably, though I don't think anyone had noted in their readings of the filings that this was being pled by DOJ. It doesn't advantage them in any way to make this claim, but you have to guess, and I've seen lots of people speculating about it because it's pretty obvious. You have to guess that uh, given that at every turn it has never been the case that all the documents ended up back in government custody correctly, uh, there's got to be some chance that, at, at the very least, that DOJ and NARA and others are probably looking into the question of, are there still more? Are there still more documents? Probably not at Mar-a-Lago, because I guess they searched it pretty thoroughly, but maybe elsewhere. He has several residences. Are there any in Trump Tower? Are there any at um, at the golf course in New Jersey? Are there any who knows where? There's any number of places they could have been stashed away. And you got to wonder whether that's really uh, the case and whether they might turn up more. But, uh, you know, there's no reason for them to have claimed as much in this filing. It doesn't get anything for them to do so. But uh, you got to imagine that they're asking that question. But at any rate, Bradley Moss uh, and I'll share with you in the roundup. Laura Rosen does more or less the same sort of thing, reading these things as she thumbs through the filing, noting her observations, including screenshots of the filing to uh, establish that, you know, what she's saying is actually grounded in the documents. And uh, it would take a while to go through, but I think it reaches the same conclusion that essentially the government here is has been dying for the opportunity to demonstrate exactly why they did this. Uh, the um, Republicans, it will make no headway with with most of the like the active, outspoken Republicans. It, it, it is possible that there are still some normal people among the rank and file of Republicans among the general public. Electeds aren't going to, you know, change their mind about anything. But they, there are some Republicans who might read this thing and say, oh, I see what you mean. Now, there are also probably some Republicans who will read it and say, well, if true, I see what you mean. But this is, after all, we should all be reminded, just an assertion by the Justice Department at this point that this is the way things went. It will undoubtedly be disputed by Trump's attorneys. They're incompetent and they're lying, so I'm not certain that they'll be able to do anything about it. But we do have to go through the formal exercise of running it before a, you know, if they were going to do this, indicting him, running it before a jury at trial and asking, okay, so the Department of Justice says that they asked for the documents in January, got 15 boxes, they subpoenaed, but they still felt they didn't get it all. So they went the subpoena route and they got 20 more boxes, but they still felt like they didn't get everything. So that's when they went to the search warrant and that they very carefully stepped things up. And the Trump team will appear in court and say, no, uh-uh, no, that's not true. You're totally lying. And, you know, and that's it. I mean, that's all they'll be able to offer. You, you have it all wrong. We were totally cooperative. Well, you know, that's not the case. These are, here's videotape of you punching us in the face when we came to ask for the documents politely. Uh, then we came with the subpoena and you kicked us in the shins and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then they'll finally say, all right, jury, well... The DOJ has carefully documented how it went about asking for the documents. And here are the photos and videotapes of the Trump people saying, no, get out of here. We don't have anything. We kick you. We hate you. You're terrible. Even though they said in court that they were being very cooperative. So now you have to go and decide which story is true. Which What do you believe about this? And in all likelihood, they come out and they say, well, you know, all the evidence is on the side of the DOJ's story. So we believe them. And therefore, uh, Donald Trump or whoever else is being charged in this is guilty. And then you'll be able to say, OK, so now officially that's the way things happened because we've convicted him in court. But right now, truthfully, it's just an assertion by the DOJ. 
And, you know, you have to have a trial or threaten to have a trial and then have uh, the defendants plead guilty to avoid a trial. I don't know how it will work out, but uh, there you go. Uh, that's that's where we stand. Laura Rosen has a much more lengthy recounting of that, but that's kind of where we are. As far as formal write-ups, uh, NBC News had one here that I put aside for us to look at. And if it's not too lengthy, we can run through that too, but it says largely the same thing. DOJ says Trump team likely, quote, concealed and removed classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. Some of the fine points that were observed by people who thumbed through the documents on top of, well, we asked and then we subpoenaed and then we searched. There's also stuff like this. The Justice Department's filing in response to this motion had uh, this to say that the Justice Department said Tuesday night that it had evidence that classified documents at Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate were likely concealed and removed before the FBI searched to retrieve them. So that will go to the question of uh, willfulness in terms of uh, charges of obstruction of justice. Again, it probably doesn't really even become necessary in uh, the Espionage Act charges, but it it won't hurt the espionage charges to point out that when we asked nicely and then we served a subpoena for these things and, and it became obvious that the next step was a search warrant, we now have evidence that Trump's people said, we anticipate a search warrant. And so we're going to go into that storage room, and I'm sure this is established by the surveillance video that they demanded that and, and received from Mar-a-Lago, amazingly enough, uh, it will show that there were people going in there and removing boxes and squirreling things away elsewhere, probably, and they will argue probably, in anticipation of a search warrant eventually being served at the property. And they were hoping that they could conceal them from even a search warrant if they moved them out of the storage office, storage room, and, and did something with them. And the question is, are those the documents that they stuck in the drawers of Trump's desks in his office? I mean... That would be a pretty dumb place to hide them because they obviously were going to go and look there. But if they were elsewhere, if they were flown to New York or New Jersey or squirreled away in a rented storage locker somewhere in West Palm Beach, I don't know. We may yet find out there's more. And uh, that's the more exciting tidbits that were, I think, uh, dropped as possibilities in this filing. So, yeah, uh, that and the pictures of all these envelopes that are marked top secret SCI, uh, there can be no doubt. I mean, these are pre-printed envelopes that say top secret all over them. I don't see how you mistake them. And then, of course, uh, Jim Jordan wanting to focus on the fact that there were Time magazine covers in a box, which it looks like there are many copies of them. And I don't know whether it's different covers or whatever, but Trump being the uh, vain idiot that he is, uh, every time he's on a magazine cover, he has it framed and mounted for him to hang on the wall, even if it's uh, a magazine announcing that he's been declared the world's biggest idiot. He'll still frame it. Anyway, so let's see. I thought that was of some interest. Politico had an article about it here, also under a similar title. Trump team likely sought to conceal classified docs at Mar-a-Lago, DOJ tells judge. So that's not really going to be real good for him having to um, address that question. All right. So some other areas of interest that I thought I might share with you. Let's see. Um, this I put aside, um, you know, a real diversion from what Trump's been doing at Pervalago, but still something worth perhaps wondering about if, you know, I mean, the intent is to get you worrying about it. But that's really up to you, whether you're going to go along with that. But a thread from Jennifer Cohn, Jenny Cohn 1 on Twitter, C-O-H-N Cohn, uh, who uh, identifies herself in her Twitter profile as an election security advocate and political writer and attorney, uh, and then some of her writing credits. Um, but she's been looking into... The activities, what, what is the notorious spy Mike Flynn up to these days? And it's a good question because uh, 
as you know, I've been uh, fairly confident in tweeting for some time since November or so, 2016, that Mike Flynn is a notorious spy and ought to be considered as such. And we almost made a spy the national security advisor. And that seemed outrageous until you found out that the president himself, the former president anyway, uh, has uh, busied himself with violations of the Espionage Act all along. So, you know, I guess it wouldn't surprise anybody who knows that the president is likely to be charged with violation of the Espionage Act that one of his former national security advisors would himself be a spy. Does that now become easier to believe? Anyway, what is he up to now, currently, in the midst of all of this? It's a relevant question. And we dive into this with a thread that she put together just uh, yesterday. But it's uh, one of several that she's put together in the past couple of days that I've taken note of but not really known exactly what to do with or where to jump in. And now, like with um, reading a Marcy Wheeler thread, um, it's it's difficult because we've jumped in at a strange place in in the in the storyline. And I don't know exactly who we're talking about here, but maybe I can just quickly Google up uh, who we might be talking about here. Uh, and I'm not I'm still not certain that I'm getting an answer that we need. But starting with the first tweet in this thread, um there's a there's a an a a person involved in oh here I can blow this up a little bit. Maybe I can get the text. Uh she begins by referring to one of the actors in this new scenario that Flynn has involved himself in, who is goes by the name of John Guandolo, Guandolo, G-U-A-N-D-O-L-O. I don't know whether I've got that accented correctly. He is uh, listed in some of the materials that she includes screenshots of here as a Marine Special Forces and former FBI Special Agent and National Security Expert. But I have the feeling that he's not that expert after all, or at least doesn't really know a great deal about uh, the implications of the things he's talking about. But it begins here, Guandolo, uh, and there is a quote, has begun offering training sessions for right-wing citizens on how to take over their towns, arrest their mayors, and destroy the lives of anyone who objects by publicly humiliating them, getting them fired, and forcing them to move. What is all this about? Well, I don't know yet, but he's working with Mike Flynn in doing it. That is the important part. And uh, included here is this screen grab with a flyer for whatever the hell sort of seminar he is um, he's putting together here. And it says uh, underneath there's a comment that's included in the screen grab. The training promises to organize communities into operational forces to identify roots of corruption and dismantle the hostile networks behind it and reestablish a Republican form of government at the local level. Flynn has been a subject of scrutiny for the House's January 6th committee uh, and then goes on from there. But uh, that's the end of the screen grab part of it. But this flyer advertises... Uh, like a, a seminar of how to, you know, organize in your community to uh, intimidate uh, people out of participating in democracy and, you know, quote unquote, expose the corruption. You know, in other words, a whole like QAnon seminar about how to use your craziness to bond together with other crazy people and disrupt your town and quote, apparently up to uh, and including arresting your mayor for some reason. And, uh, what the hell are we talking about? And here's a flyer for a July 19th through 21st weekend, I guess, seminar about this called Understanding the Threat, Strategic and Operational Training and Consulting on the Threat of the Global Islamic Movement. They're back to uh, persecuting uh, Muslims with this. Uh, let's see. So Understanding the Threat into Action, an into action class with General Michael Flynn, who has his picture here, uh, 
uh, on the flyer. Our mission to organize communities into operational forces, right? We said this, to identify the roots of corruption and dismantle the hostile networks behind it and reestablish a Republican form of government at the local level. What it has to do with uh, targeting the global Islamic movement, uh, unclear, but I guess it gives you the operational cover of saying, well, we're being uh, anti-terrorist, even though uh, it's they're they're still a far away from claiming that Muslims have taken over government in this country, but uh, you know I guess they can claim whatever they want. What what to expect for your two hundred and ninety five dollars, the cost of admission to this seminar? Day one, you will learn you'll learn the primary adversaries. I'll say it that way that America faces in the war and the founding principles for which we are fighting. That'd be nice to know. The doctrine, networks, and modus operandi of the movements at the root of all of the anti-American issues. Policies and activities will be covered in detail so students, if that's what you call them, can understand and identify the threats. Learn how hostile individuals and organizations have insinuated themselves into local, state, and federal government and private entities. So wherever you look. There are terrible, terrible people, and we will teach you how to identify them with certainty and attack them and ruin their lives because it's important that you do that and that the government not be the ones to do that for some reason. On day two, you'll discover information on hostile activity in the local area as well as how to research and identify key individuals and organizations behind the activity whatever it may be. Discover how information warfare and propaganda is used and fed to Americans via multitude, a multitude of sources to control how Americans perceive reality, which is totally not what's happening here in this flyer, because we're against that. We would never put that in our own flyer. Day three, you will obtain tools to establish a ground team. Uh oh and engage at the local and state level. Learn how to conduct information operations, communication and security training to others, as well as strategic considerations to engage these threats at the ground level. By the end of the course, students will be organized to effectively accomplish specific missions in their communities to reduce the adversary's ability to operate while beginning the process of reestablishing a Republican form of government at the county level. It sounds... Let's say county, right? Yeah. Um, like very exciting for wannabe spies or revolutionaries or you know, patriots, as they might style themselves. Um, but uh, no indication of exactly what the problem is that they're fighting against. But wink, wink, we're all supposed to know somehow. Uh, here are the, the instructors are John Guandolo, John Bennett, also claiming to be a retired Marine and counterintelligence agent and national security expert, and Claire Lopez, also a Marine OCS graduate. Uh, that doesn't tell us too much. Former CIA case officer and national security expert. They all claim to be national security experts. And uh, you can sign up here at this website name and uh, email address. And let's see. Venue location will be shared upon completed RSVP. So it's going to keep you the secret. So what the hell is all this about? We might ask Jennifer. And Jennifer goes ahead and tells us, uh, oh my God, this is bad. She begins with this. It's, uh, okay, the same guy, right? Who are we talking about here? Um, why is this, is this connected? This isn't even part of the thread, is it? Oh, I guess it's number 11 in the thread. So we got to start over again. Uh, for some reason, it condensed it down and jumped to thread number 11. But number two here is the link to Michael Flynn teams up with radical far-right activist John Guandolo. This comes from Flux.community, with which I'm not familiar here. Um, but uh, we're we'll going to take a look at what they have to say here. Um, in their article about it. When's the article from? Late July. John Guandolo... This was first published by Right Wing Watch. That's the source that we've seen before. Guandolo is a right wing conspiracy theorist and anti-Islam activist so radical that in the wake of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, he praised insurrectionists for showing restraint by not publicly executing lawmakers. How nice. Many of whom he claimed are, in fact, quote, traitors who should be, quote, swinging from a rope. Hmm. After leaving the FBI in disgrace in 2009, Guandolo founded an organization called Understanding the Threat, through which he trains law enforcement agencies around the country 
Law enforcement agencies. Yes, that's true. We've heard about this kind of training uh, for a while now, and I guess now it's moving to the general public under Mike Flynn's auspices to train people in QAnon insurgency, I suppose. But it was bad enough when he was in, uh, training law enforcement agents around the country to identify seemingly anyone with dark skin and a beard as an Islamic terrorist. In recent months, Guandalo's organization has been offering training sessions for right-wing citizens on how to take over their towns, arrest their mayors, and destroy the lives of anyone who objects by publicly humiliating them, getting them fired from their jobs, and forcing them to move away. That's where this quote came from. Guandalo and his team are leading just such a training session at an undisclosed location this week. That was back at the end of July, of course. According to an email Guandalo sent to Understanding the Threat subscribers, right-wing conspiracy theorist and former Trump National Security Advisor Michael Flynn is participating in this July session. The training promises to do all the things we read you about in the flyer. Flynn has been the subject of scrutiny for the January 6th committee, which last week revealed Flynn's participation in a December 2020 meeting with former President Trump, in which he spewed voter fraud conspiracy theories and urged Trump to seize voting machines. That same month, Flynn's, Flynn also urged the former president to declare martial law. When questioned by the committee whether he believed the violence on January 6th was justified, Flynn pleaded the Fifth Amendment. Oh, okay. Very interesting. And, of course, uh, remember, the Flyers say they're going to restore a Republican form of government, but Flynn says he wanted to see martial law. So it seems like they're working at cross purposes here just a little bit. Anyway, tweet number three says, Guandalo has done presentations for 88 Tactical of Nebraska. And there's a related thread that I had seen the other day from Jennifer about this 88 tactical group, and of course, 88, you know, quite a well-known uh, dog whistle for racists and, and Hitler fans. But Guandalo has done some of his presentation work at this weirdo place, 88 Tactical, which, let's say, is the separate thread easily encapsulated. Um, what she was driving at the other day, and I put aside but didn't get to share with you, was... Uh, she was pointing to some other person's Twitter work here, Everett Stern, saying he has claimed that he was told that Michael Flynn was setting up paramilitary operations in Nebraska, where 88 Tactical is. Everett Stern, um, of, uh, oh, you may remember um, him as a U.S. Senate candidate at one point uh, in, was it in Pennsylvania? I think so. And I don't know whether he's still running an independent campaign or not. But anyway, it was Everett Stern's claim that Flynn was setting up paramilitary operations, I guess, in cooperation with these 88 tactical people. Ali Alexander and Alex Jones had his, have each visited Nebraska this month. And maybe it's nothing, but maybe it's something you want to keep an eye on. I think that's an interesting place to land, Nebraska. And, uh, well, at any rate, I think that was all kind of conjecture at this point, but it was something to keep an eye on. Jennifer continues, whatever it takes, it's enclosed in quote here, John Guandolo trains a right wing, trains right wing activists to ruin the lives of anyone opposing their agenda. That was uh, published originally in Right Wing Watch and sort of describing what this guy is all about. And I guess relevant screen grabs from it are uh, featured here in tweet number five and six for a mere $15,000. I guess that's when he's training law enforcement, uh, communities there. $15,000. Guandolo explained how he teaches activists not only to identify and remove hostile operators, quote unquote, from the local government, but also to publicly humiliate anyone who opposes their efforts and get them fired from their jobs and force them to move out of the community. Our into action training program that I created about five years ago is specifically targeted at training citizens, Guandolo said. The goal is to show citizens how to organize a team at the county, local level, identify hostile operators, individuals and organizations in your local community, flush them out and reestablish a Republican form of government at the local level. It's a three day program. I don't understand how the $15,000 thing got into it, but three day program. 
Uh, oh, okay. $295 a seat. And he says, we need just 250 or need 50 people. Does that, that doesn't, does that reach $15,000 level? I'll have to do the math there, which he says is a bargain. We will literally organize you as a team. We will show you how to research the bad guys in the community. We'll give you an overview of what they're doing, how they're doing it. I don't know. I mean, I'm not certain how effective he's been in getting like, does he even fill the 50 seats, but it's something to watch. The given the fact that we've had, you know, so much paramilitary activity as it is, whether it's uh, the Proud Boys or Oath Keepers or whoever else, I mean, they've been something of a joke in terms of their efficacy to date, but they are, of course, escalating their operations. And January 6th was uh, top of the list, and some of them are facing seditious conspiracy charges finally. But I guess uh, the fear is, and I don't know how real it is, that they are organizing still more of them you, through the use of 88 Tactical. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. I'll just say, I think by way of summary of what Jennifer seems to be saying, it's, it's, I'll be honest with you, it's difficult to suss out exactly, like, substantively. Well, what are we saying here? Summarize this for me, and there's no way to do it because it's just a series of alarmed tweets about, oh, my God, this guy is so terrible. Oh, my God, that guy is so terrible. And, oh, I feel sick to my stomach. It's just kind of... Uh, being a little melodramatic about it. But I mean, you know, there's a lot at stake here, certainly. But anyway, all I can really tell you uh, about uh, what we can take away from this without digging deeper ourselves here is that uh, it, it is, and I, I would say it's uh, worth uh, uh, keeping an eye on the likelihood that, at the very least, that there will be further activity in organizing paramilitary and militia organizations. I mean, they've had tremendous success with it so far, except that they keep getting charged with seditious conspiracy. But uh, there's no reason why, I mean, just purely as grift, you wouldn't find others trying to replicate the success, such as it is, of the Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, Proud Boys, etc., and fleecing people for their dollars. Uh, and uh, I guess their niche is, well, we're going to be Tra training you to uh, find the infiltrators in local government. And, uh, you know, if it's not, uh, if we can't interest you in looking for infiltrators who are part of a global Muslim conspiracy, well, then fine. Uh, they'll be, for these purposes, you know, purposes of getting you to pay to come to the seminar, we'll say they're a global CRT conspiracy instead, or global QAnon identified uh, pedophiles and vampires and traffickers whatever excites you and gets you to pay the 295 dollars we can accommodate you by accusing your our enemies of being that whatever the hot thing of the day is but apparently the real problem is that it involves people like mike flynn who have drawing power uh that they have an organized underground ish kind of i mean it's out in the open and everything but it's underground to normal people the seamy underbelly of all this weird stuff is that they have people who are willing to, cause for money, travel the country and rile people up and tell them that they can combat global evil by showing up at a, you know, uh, at a school board meeting and declaring that the people there are vampires, uh, pedophiles, human traffickers, uh, secret Muslims, 
and uh, terrorists and Antifa as well uh, out to destroy America and that it's their right as citizens to arrest and murder them. And apparently this also ropes in people as uh, prominent as the chair of the Oklahoma Republican Party, John Bennett, who is apparently tied in with this organization as well. And between this and their weirdo networks of gun clubs like 88 Tactical, uh, they put together these uh, dangerous training sessions to turn lunatics into uh, armed lunatics. And uh, and that we should be watching out for that. And that uh, I guess the epicenter of this particular activity is in Oklahoma and Nebraska, which, uh, by the way, I think we should probably know for the record is where they blew up a federal building back in the early to mid 90s. And Tim McVeigh uh, had his day and then got executed. So and now, of course, they're all running around saying, oh, no, no. It's the other people, the Hillary Clintons and Joe Bidens and Anthony Fauci's of the world who we should be executing. You see, don't you understand? We're the sane ones. Uh, and you got to look out for terrorist bombers like the Muslims or us, you know, the, if you just want to be thorough about it. Uh, anyway, there's not too much more I can uh, stand to bring you from this. It's a very alarmist thread. But <clears throat> calling out some names and locations in case they turn up. In future investigations, uh, there's also mention here of, a, um, I guess, the new dapper Nazi is a Oklahoma state Senate candidate, Jackson Lam Lameyer, Lameyer, I don't know how he pronounces, L-A-H-M-E-Y-E-R, and he's all into dressing up in a suit and tie and then making, recording videos in his car, which is the hot thing for crazy people to do, I'm not really sure why that is, um, but recording crazy videos of himself in his car talking, you know, uh, hinting darkly about uh, Jews controlling the world and uh, everybody being pedophiles, et cetera, et cetera. That's a name you should look out for in the future as well. So I don't know. We'll have to leave it at this point because it's just not coherent enough really at this point, unfortunately, to, to really pull anything out. But uh, I'll show you the thread. You can... Think what you want about it afterwards. But uh, yeah, really, I just offer it up in terms of, uh uh-oh, you know, as stupid and uh, as poorly organized as the whole thing appears to be, they do have money. And you got to watch out for that. And uh, occasionally all it takes is enough dollars to rent a truck and buy a bunch of fertilizer and these guys become problems again. And uh, there's every indication that we're, you know, headed toward that level of craziness again, and we should be aware of it. All right, let's see. Um, And I guess to that end, that makes a good segue to these stories, which I will bring to your attention because they really haven't received much attention. I got, uh, I noticed a, a, a story come across the wires yesterday And I was just marveling at the fact that, uh, hey, I even for someone like me who pays pretty close attention to gun violence stories of various types, I didn't notice any of this. And it's really remarkable that I didn't and that it doesn't rise to the level of, you know, in front of everybody's face national news. Um, and when I said it, I, that I was surprised about it, I got this tweet from our Twitter friend, that guy, that guy 3002, who uh, sent me a link to this tweet of his from just the other day, that uh, this is a retweet of someone else's note about an incident in Arizona, Phoenix, I think, Arizona, just the other day. This was an active shooter situation, he writes, in Arizona that last night where the shooter was wearing tactical gear, had a semi-automatic rifle, opened fire on a police SUV, threw a Molotov cocktail, and this guy didn't even make the national news. That's pretty interesting, right? Here is the police department narrative. Uh, According to Brom Resnick, who is Brom Resnick? He covers politics and democracy for KPNX-TV, an NBC affiliate there in Phoenix. And here is the police narrative 
under the understated headline, Officer Involved Shooting, which is usually, you know, kind of their throwaway statement about various interactions that they have with the public in which they shoot members of the public, sure, but uh, it's usually more along the lines of um, this is a person who was, uh, you know, drunk and disorderly and had a gun and threatened to shoot police as opposed to, you know, maybe the somewhat more concerning situation as described here. Here's how the cops put it. Phoenix police are investigating an officer-involved shooting involving a suspect that killed two people and injured five others, including two police officers. On August 28th, around 8.30 p.m., did you hear a lot about this in the news? Phoenix police received a call about shots fired in the area of 2600 West Deer Valley Road near several businesses. As officers arrived in the area, a suspect armed with a semi-automatic rifle and wearing tactical gear, uh uh-oh, immediately opened fire on several fully marked patrol SUVs. So he knew he was shooting at cops here. Four patrol cars were riddled with bullets. One officer was struck by a bullet in the shoulder. A second officer was hit by shrapnel in multiple places, including the face. The officer shot in the shoulder was able to get out of his car and return fire in the direction of the suspect before other officers came to his aid to remove him from the area for medical treatment. Other arriving officers began evacuating nearby businesses and bringing community members to a safe place. Preliminary investigation information, investigative information, along with surveillance video from nearby businesses, shows the suspect leaving a room at a motel in the area and going on a shooting spree. Just going. On one. The suspect is seen firing his rifle into the motel, then turning the rifle on a car, pulling into the parking lot. Two people inside that car died on the scene from gunshot wounds. It's serious. The suspect is also seen throwing a Molotov cocktail at a restaurant window. Thankfully, he's inept and it did not ignite. It was about that time that officers began to arrive and were met with gunfire. Surveillance video shows the suspect making his way through the parking lot and then falling to the ground. The Maricopa County Medical Examiner will determine the manner of death, but it appears he may have taken his own life. The suspect was found with a rifle, several magazines, incendiary devices, a gas mask and helmet nearby. Three other innocent bystanders in various locations around the shooting scene were injured by flying gunfire. Flying gunfire, okay. Three, all three wounded victims were treated at hospitals and released. So that's what the cops have to say. And the newspapers had something to say about some of these things too. But it wasn't the only such incident at the same time. So, like I said, there was this Phoenix situation And here's CNN's coverage of it, and it's not that far removed from the uh, police narrative. A gunman clad in tactical gear and armed with a semi-automatic rifle killed two and injured five others in Phoenix shooting, police say. And, uh, well, the story is largely the same. Uh, The victims haven't been named by authorities. Of the two killed, one was an adult man, the other an adult woman, the police report said. Uh, Police officers suffered non-life-threatening injuries, as did three other bystanders, all of whom are adult men. The shooter has been identified. I mean, we don't want to publicize necessarily, but a 24-year-old, and apparently a white guy, believe it or not, um, and uh, he's named here, if you really feel like digging up the name yourself. The police said this on Monday, noting that they believed he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So once again, good guys with guns didn't uh, stop him. He stopped himself. Investigators discovered he was clad in a steel-plated ballistic vest, knee pads, a ballistic helmet, etc., the release said. One officer remains hospitalized with a gunshot wound is in stable condition. Phoenix officers responded to the calls of shots fired. We got that whole thing. Uh, this is all pretty much from the police narrative and release. Um, let's see, is there more that's added to it here? Uh, shooting remains under investigation. The incident was just one of several shootings across the country this weekend. That's always the case, but this time, including one that we have another reference to one at a grocery store in Bend, Oregon where authorities said a man with a AR-15 style rifle killed two people and injured a third. In Houston, another gunman set fire to a building and then shot the people who fled, killing three and injuring two. 
the police chief said. Other shootings took place at the Coney Island Boardwalk in New York, a Sikh temple in Stockton, California, and outside a hotel in Indianapolis, where, as I understand it, uh, three Dutch soldiers who were in the U.S. for some training exercises were shot, and one of them, I believe, actually was killed in the shooting. And I think that's probably the end of these military exchanges. You can't go to the United States, you'll get killed. I know, but we're soldiers, we're getting trained, right? Yeah, but it's not supposed to be a war zone, it's supposed to be just a regular streetscape. Well, anyway, Phoenix Police Chief Jerry Williams con- condemned the shooting in a news conference late Sunday night, calling it another example of gun violence in our community, which it is. It's the least you can possibly say about it, but I mean, doesn't it say a little something else? How many more officers have to be shot? How many more community members have to be killed before those in our community take a stand? This is not a Phoenix police issue. This is a community issue, Williams said. If not now, when? I mean, it's good rhetoric and all, but it's more than, uh, you know, gun violence in our community. It's a nutcase putting on tactical gear and ballistic vests and going out with weapons of war and Molotov cocktails, weapons of war as well, and just randomly on a streetscape in phoenix i guess between that and the one in bend which i'll tell you about i mean let me just grab that article and it's important to to tell you about what happened with this one too let me just i'll read you the article and then i guess i'll pose the questions at the end of the show here investigators are still working to figure out why a shooter killed two people at an oregon safeway here's what we know Elizabeth Wolf reporting for CNN. As shoppers at a grocery in Bend, Oregon, meandered down aisles and considered produce choices Sunday night. Nice setting the scene. A 20-year-old gunman, and what do you know, he's a white guy, burst into the Safeway store and began firing, killing two people and injuring at least two others. Did you hear it? Did you hear about it? I mean, that's my major question. These two things happened, along with other shootings, which may or may not be related. These two things may not even be related, but they're they're more related, I think, because of the tactical gear and the AR-15 than they might be to Coney Island boardwalk shootings or something like that. But did you hear any of this? And I mean, it's it's a, a fair question all by itself just to ask, did you hear about the fact that there are like five, six shootings a night? I mean, you've heard that before, but do you really hear it each day in the news? Does Monday start with... Wow. I mean, look at all these multiple shootings all over the place. We're really crazy in this country. But if that doesn't do it, then maybe at least how about just collecting the stories of people who show up in tactical gear with incendiary devices and start shooting all over the place? Like, is this, I guess, in light of what the alarmism of the previous thread that I, you know, I I have a hard time giving credence to. But um, in light of that, I mean, I guess. Also alongside Lindsey Graham saying, well, there's going to be riots in the street if Trump is indicted. Well, on the one hand, maybe we should take that seriously because there are people in tactical gear with AR-15s and Molotov cocktails already doing stuff like this. It may be totally unrelated to this, but it may be driven by the Cincinnati attack against the FBI building was, I think, easy enough to connect to being incited to do this because of what Trump's been up to. But I guess uh, now I'll pose the question beforehand, but I'll return to the story because it's an important one. If there were riots in the streets, after all, I'm starting to wonder whether we would even notice. I mean, people are showing up in tactical gear with AR-15s and fire bombs and pulling stunts like this in the middle of, you know, fairly major well, towns, if not major cities across America and we're like, I don't know, one happened in Bend, Oregon, and one happened in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So they're not related. But are they? I don't know. I mean, it might not be coordinated, but they might still yet be related. Why are so many 20-something-year-old white guys dressing up in fake combat gear and just randomly taking on a Safeway and a motel? And we're going to just blast the hell out of whatever's nearby me. Why is that happening? And why are we not saying... Why is this happening in multiple places? And, uh, oh, well, uh, all news is local. Well, uh, well, here's gun violence in our community. Darn it, I hate that stuff. Or what are we looking at here? Well, anyway, let me read you what happened in Bend because it has another angle on it that I think is important and interesting 
to take note of. So in comes this guy uh, with a gun at the Safeway. Police responded to the Forum Shopping Center around 7 p.m., authorities said. Rushing in, they could hear gunshots. And, and believe it or not, they actually rushed in hearing gunshots. In Uvalde, they don't do that, right? But they discovered at the time and the end of it, a shooter dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So once again, the good guys with guns are too late. Uh, but again, you know, that's what the, why the NRA says you need more good guys with guns. Good guy. Only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, except for this weekend and every other weekend when we'd have multiple shooters and they're stopped by themselves, which means that the bad guy with the gun stopped the bad guy with the gun. And of course, you know, when you hold that up against 12 plus good guys with guns and ballistic shields who were supposedly trained for the purpose of stopping bad guys with the guns didn't stop the bad guy with the gun in any time to do anybody any good in Uvalde. But here in Bend, uh, yes, the shooter takes his own life, but wait, there is an intervention from a good guy. It's just that it's a good guy without a gun. Good guys without guns have a much better track record stopping mass shooters, bad guys with guns, than good guys with guns do. That's kind of, you know, the larger trend I wanted to illustrate with this. Anyway, here comes the cops. They come in. They can hear gunshots. Then they discover the shooter dead. He'd entered wielding an AR-15 style rifle and a shotgun after firing in the parking lot, officials said. It was yet another American shooting in which a young man with such a rifle unleashed carnage at a place usually considered safe. A New York supermarket. Buffalo, a Texas elementary school, a 4th of July parade in Illinois. Now, the gunman is identified by police as Bend, a Bend resident. I won't give you his name. You can read it. As investigators work to uncover his motive, here's what we know about the shooting. And here's how the attack unfolded. The gunman entered through an apartment complex behind the shopping center. Bend Police Department spokesperson Sheila Miller said... He then began firing an AR-15 style rifle as he crossed the parking lot. Upon entering the store, he shot an 84-year-old man shopping there, Glenn Edward Bennett, who died on the way to the hospital. The shooter kept moving through the store and firing, Miller said. In the produce department, Safeway employee Donald Ray Surratt Jr., 66, confronted the gunman and was fatally shot, she said. Responding to 911 calls about the shooting, Bend Police Department officers arrived within three minutes, Miller said. Gunshots were being fired as they burst into the Safeway, Miller said. Almost immediately, officers found the gunman dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, she said. Close to the shooter's body, they found the rifle and the shotgun, Police Chief Mike Kranz said. Investigators also found, are you ready for this? three Molotov cocktails and a sawed-off shotgun in his car, along with additional ammunition in an apartment. Uh, police are working with the ATF to determine if he possessed the firearms legally. This is important. We need to know this. But Molotov cocktails again. What are you hearing about this? About people showing up in tactical gear with AR-15s and Molotov cocktails at shopping centers in smallish, middling-sized cities across America and just opening fire. Nothing. I mean, really nothing. And it's not even like, oh, well, uh, just another shooting, so we had to dismiss it kind of thing. There's a, there's a, an angle here. Uh, reported in the next section of this thing. Employee killed while trying to disarm shooter. And if nothing else, this should be a national story for this reason. As the gunman made his way through the store, Surratt, remember, uh, what was the full name here? Donald Ray Surratt Jr. Surratt attacked and tried to disarm him, but was shot and killed, Miller said. Surratt's quick action likely saved lives, officials have said. Because remember, at that point, the police arrive and they hear some gunshots and discover him dead on the floor, likely by self-inflicted gunshot wounds. So it's not that Surratt stopped and killed him, but he did stop the shooting. He sacrificed his life in the end to stop the shooting spree. And uh, this guy who had armed himself for this mayhem and mass murder, and by the way, you know, in reading some more about the suspect, it turns out, oh, he was a hard guy wannabe in all respects. He was a martial arts trained guy and he went and got the badass weapons and had a manifesto and everything. And he was going to take out everybody and he was going to take no crap from nobody, damn it. And he's the toughest guy around. I'll show you. 
and a 66-year-old guy in the produce department wrestled him to the point where uh, he's, he frustrated him to the point where he ended up shooting himself as well as this guy who intervened, but shooting him and then saying, I'm going to kill myself. This is the end of my spree. So Mr. Tough Guy got taken out by the 66-year-old produce department guy who was a veteran, to be sure, and that may have driven his sense of purpose in, in intervening. But, I mean, that's what it, it that's what you take people out with. It's not a good guy with a gun. You know, like they, they always say, NRA people always tell you, uh, guns don't kill people, people do, right? Well, good guys with guns don't stop bad guys with guns. Good guys stop them. It's the good guy that does the thing. And of course, it could be a good, you know, well, pick your gender or non-gender specific designator. A good person will stop the bad guy with the gun, even if they don't have guns. But the, what they're not admitting to over at the NRA is that this still means that this hobby of theirs always ends up with somebody else paying with their life for this horrific hobby that people have. Anyway, why isn't it in the news that in two places, in two random locations, people with tactical weapons and Molotov cocktails in combat gear show up and just start shooting people? Like, this is a story. If it would happen in Phoenix and Bend, Oregon on the same day. Same day. Molotov cocktails and everything. And they still can't make a national story. Can't connect the dots. I don't know what's going on around here. But in the meantime, Mike Flynn is doing this thing, training people to take out enemies and uh, the Former president of the United States is saying that, uh, you, you know, you're going to have Second Amendment solutions to this stuff. And they got a sitting senator saying there's going to be riots in the streets. I think they're happening. And we don't know when I were just like, well, right, two random things. I don't know. Some guy got shot in Coney Island. Do you think that that's part of the conspiracy? Well, people get shot in Coney Island all the time. Sure, there's random gun violence. But I mean, the Molotov cocktails, really? This does this. This triggers nothing in anybody. And in the meantime, there's every other reason for this to be a national story. This guy, uh, to continue on with the CNN reporting, while we're still gathering facts about last night's shooting, this police spokesperson says, <clears throat> it's clear that far more people could have been killed if not for the heroism of Donald Ray Surratt Jr., who intervened to help stop the shooter and the officers who entered while shots were still being fired Governor Kate Brown said in a statement, in the face of senseless violence, they acted with selfless bravery. Their courage saved lives, Brown said. And she's including the cops here. And at least they didn't Uvalde out. That We can at least praise them for that. But this guy literally, like I guess veterans or, you know, and people in the armed forces are trained to do, laid down their lives for others. This guy should be the biggest hero in America at the moment. And instead, it's crickets, even though there's every reason in the world to be reporting the story just for the sake of letting people know that this guy lived and died for others this way. But also as a larger gun violence narrative, look at what's happening in this country, but also as, you know, hey, it was weird that in two places, people were simultaneously motivated to dress up in combat gear and show up with AR-15s and Molotov cocktails and should we be worried about that? Well, anyway, back to this reporting. Other employees were working a closing shift in the deli when they heard loud gunfire, said one who identified himself only as Robert to the Central Oregon Daily News. Me and three other employees ran into a walk-in refrigerator and closed the door and stayed there and stayed hidden until authorities arrived. That's what you're supposed to do, unless you're brave enough to lay down your life like, like uh, Donald Surratt did. Josh Kaba and his four children were shopping when the shots broke out, he told CNN affiliate KTVZ. We started heading to the front. Then we heard, I don't know how many shots out front, six or seven. I immediately turned to my children and said, run. People were screaming. It was a horrifying experience, Kaba said. Kaba worried about his wife, who'd stayed in the car because she wasn't feeling well. But when he and three of his children fled through exit doors by the produce department, he found she'd driven to the back of the store and was sitting in the car saying, get in the car, get in the car. How did she know? I mean, I hope she communicated to them that she was going to the back. Well, I, I, apparently they did. But gosh, what a scene. Anyway, uh, so of, it's, of course, complete with all the manifesto and plans posted online, all the stuff that you usually see in these situations. But uh, gosh, I mean, really, honestly, I, shouldn't everybody know the name of this guy, Donald Surratt Jr.? Donald Ray Surratt, sorry, Surratt Jr. 
I mean, should not we be having flags at half staff, et cetera? I mean, we should be celebrating this guy. I mean, I don't know what he was like other than this. I, mean, I guess you got to be cautious all the time with who you hold up as a hero. But I mean, certainly this action. How is it that it isn't the case that more people know about the story at, at, at a minimum about the, the heroism, if not... Uh, hey, we're having armed attacks all over the country all of a sudden. I mean, is that not enough to bend Oregon and Phoenix, Arizona? Is not enough to say uh, we could be looking at something serious here? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just a precursor to it. But it does make me wonder if there were riots in the streets, as uh, Lindsey Graham puts it, whether we would know. And how would we know when things have begun? Has, has the revolution begun and we just don't know it? Um, is the, this just going to motivate individual attackers in all these places? Is every grocery store going to be under attack like this? I don't know. I don't know. And we still haven't gotten to the point where we have arrested Donald Trump on an open shut case violation of the Espionage Act. So I don't know. I despair of this slow walk to everything, but I guess it's all we can do in this country because we have armed attackers just wandering the streets, shooting up supermarkets. And it's like, meh, may or may not be the same thing as that other guy with Molotov cocktails. I don't know. That's astonishing to me. But I think I've made that point. Now it's time for me to hand things over to Justice Putnam to make his point about what he's been reading in the news in the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, which comes up next. Uh, let's see what he's got on tap for you. Dominion Voting Systems has deposed Tucker Carlson, Janine Pirro, and a couple of others in its $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit. A House Oversight Committee calls for vigorous cryptocurrency fraud oversight. That sounds good. And the Justice Department will no longer allow political appointees to go to fundraisers and other campaign events. Sounds smart for depoliticizing ahead of the election. You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with David Waldman. More crap going on now. Uh, European plan for floating gas terminals raises climate fears. And China has placed millions of its citizens under renewed lockdown following fresh outbreaks of COVID-19. Ain't done with that stuff either, folks. (sighs) Stay tuned for more. We'll see you tomorrow.